Question. Why does history always align so seamlessly with the message of the Hebrew Bible? The answer can be summed up in one statement. History has the same author as the Torah. Today on the Exodus Project, you're going to delve into a page of that history which is often overlooked. This is what the media is not telling you. everybody this is another episode of the exodus project i'm joined my good friend rabbi stuart federo uh after quite a hiatus how you doing rabbi it's been a little while i've uh, been doing okay it's good i thought we met last week did we i can't remember I don't i'm an old man i can't I remember anything but regardless we're here now and um a few weeks ago we did a episode uh, about British Mandate Palestine, you know, yes, parts of history that people just don't really know about, right? But yeah, absolutely, and remember, that's not our, it's not my field. Sure, sure, yeah. but it just goes to show, though, that the information is out there, right? If people are willing to read it and accept it as fact, which it is, right. So today we are going to go a, f uh, a bit farther back in time, a few thousand years, actually. Yeah, uh, and uncover some hidden history regarding who the Philistines were, um, where the name Palestine, Philistia, all that comes from, yep. etc. And you know, just kind of try to connect some dots here, um, and hopefully it resonates with some people. People can formulate their own opinion, but if you don't have all the information, then it's you know, it's, it's an uninformed opinion. Right. So, um, yeah. So let's hop right into this, but before we get started, hit that subscribe button, everyone turn on the notifications, give the rabbi and myself a big thumbs up and please check the description. Plenty of awesome resources down there. Rabbi's book, his learn Hebrew in one hour is linked. Um, as well as, you know, many other, many other resources. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. So let's hop right into this. Let me know when you can see it. I can see it. I can see clearly now. <laughs> it's raining here, so that's, uh, can't sing that. <laughs> nope. All right. So the Philistines. Oh, now it's blue. There we go. Mm-hmm. So, Mr. Learn Hebrew in one hour, do you want to break this down? <laughs> well, Hebrew, kind of, sort of, in a way, a little bit like English. Each word in Hebrew has a root meaning. Right. Okay. And by changing the vowels, the pronunciation of the root consonants, uh, you sort of change the meaning of the word. But it will always go back to the most basic elemental right. meaning of the root letters. Sure, sure. And plishtim is how we say a Philistine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Peleshet is how we say Philistia or Palestine. But the root letters come from the word invader or intruder or immigrant. In other words, people who aren't from here. Right. In other words, the, the word Philistine, okay, which the the people for whom that word came okay it has its own history but in the hebrew the indication is clear right. they are not people from our land 
immigrants yeah and, and immigrants invaders and basic essence yeah it's it's someone exactly. who's not from here yeah. right so and that's the significant take home from the word philistine right all right and as you can see up on the screen everyone this is all clearly like the same word right just with suffixes Good. and so on and, and little change in vowels to change the pronunciation but the root letters are still the same and they're derived from the word that means invader intruder uh immigrant immigrant very interesting you know i think i think a lot of people just will read and that's i think that's a lot of the problem of reading things through translation is they're going to see oh well, the Philistines are their own nation, but they don't actually know what Philistines means. No, right? but, it, but, it, but it root letters in the Hebrew means he ain't from here. Yeah, exactly. He's not indigenous. Right, right. Yeah, and that, that's a significant thing. And we're going to see that here on this on this slide, because initially here, when the land was apportioned to the tribes, this map shows... How they were exactly how that apportioning was to work out right and as as you can see in the in the tribal apportionment of judah what three coastal cities are there that are in modern day gaza is gaza ashkelon and ashdod right right very interesting when you see that the initial apportioning of the land that i don't think really anyone would disagree with from how, how, this is over bi biblical history how can they disagree exactly from over three thousand years ago right this is how the, the land would have been divided right can is it possible to make the map a little bit bigger sure uh, you know just there we go so now you thank you perfect right there so now you can see gaza which is aza in hebrew ashkelon ashdod yaffa which is Actually, where Tel Aviv now is, give her a little in the area. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. You can see Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Okay. People who are quick to count will see how many areas are there: Simeon, Judah, Reuben, right. Benjamin, Dan, Ephraim, God, Manasseh, Asher, Zebulon, Issachar, Mass, Manasseh, and Naphtali. Wait, that's 13. Oh, but I thought there were only 12 tribes. Yes, but we said Manasseh and Ephraim. Two half eight. tribes. Yep. That's right. So there are 13 sections, 13 areas. And if you look in Naphtali, that's where the modern West Bank is. Uh, not exactly. No? No, it's it's between the Dead Sea on the bottom, Sea of, sea of oh. Salt in the Hebrew, and the Galilee, which is the between like Manasseh and Naphtali. All right. Okay. So, yeah. Because yeah. yep. yeah, look, you, you've got Jerusalem next to the Dead Sea, sort of under kind of, well, it's under Benjamin, but I think the map is a little weird there. But anyway, the point is, is that slightly north of that. So Shem. Right. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yep, right. Yep. So, right. So, but it's still in Manasseh. It's still our territory. It's still, you know, the, ha the, uh, 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 Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Right. Uh, it's still ours. Yep. Right. Yep. And with that in mind, and understanding that the the name Palishtim, now that we have these two things together, we understand that they are encroaching. Right. On invaders. Invaders. Sure. Right. Sure. Oh, and another word for invader. Colonialists. Yep. Colonizer. Take over the land, make it your own. Yep. And as we as we move on later into the presentation, we're going to see that who these Philistines actually were. Right. And Which I hope is I don't get canceled. Also, also May not very be interesting. Who is there today, you know? Yeah, how could it be? But yes. All right. And here's a map during the time of David and Solomon. Right. As you can see, you now have Philistia or the land of the invaders. Right. Right? Yes. And notice how much bigger it is, okay, than, than the Gaza Strip. Right. Okay. Because they made invasions. 
mm-hmm. they were constantly attacking. Yep. So for sure. Yep. Okay. All right. So this comes from Britannica. Um, the word Palestine derives from Philistia, as we mentioned. The name which was actually given, you know, that rendering, that spelling, is the name given by Greek writers to the land of the Philistines, who in the 12th century BCE, so after after the land is settled by the Jews under Joshua the son of Nun, right, if this is 12th century BCE, this is after that's already occurring. So they occupied a small pocket of land on the southern coast between modern Tel Aviv, Yafo, and Gaza. The name was revived, this is also interesting, by the Romans in the 2nd century CE in Syria, Palestina, designating the southern part of the province of Syria, and made its way thence into Arabic, where it has been used to describe the region, at least since the early Islamic area. Era. Yeah, a, couple, a couple of things have to be understood. There are two periods that people will say is the exodus from egypt they will either say it's the 1300s or they will or they will say it's 14 the middle of 1400s okay but even if you take the later one which i disagree with but that's me uh if you take the later one of the 1300s that's still 100 years before well okay but the 12th century bce is the 1100s right so if they were there the 13th Oh, century, so you're saying okay, so you're not saying the, you're not saying the 13th century BCE, you're saying the 14th century BCE, the 1300s. Okay. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and years. most and the what I think is more accurate for a lot of reasons, Moses the the Moses story, the Exodus from Egypt is probably in the middle 1400s, so the middle 15th century BCE. Well, I, I think I told you and this is a little yeah. off topic, but they found a they found, you know, Mount uh Har Eval, Mount Ebal, in mm-hmm. um, where the blessings and the cursings were. Right. On Mount Ebal, they actually found a lead tablet uh, with a Hebrew inscription on it that dates to, I want to say it actually is the very, very early, so right after the 1400s, like the end of the right. See, that, that... beginning of the 1300s BCE. More proof to me that it's the 1450s, middle 1400s, instead of the 1300s. Mm-hmm. And what what happens? This is not just quickly, and then we'll move on. But they'll say, "Oh, the Exodus happened in the 1300s," and then they'll look around for evidence. They won't find any evidence in the 1300s, and then they'll say, "See, it never really happened." Right. <laughs> but if exactly. you go back another exactly. hundred years to the middle 1400s, yeah, then you'll start uncovering stuff. Now yeah. all of a sudden, you start seeing things. Mm-hmm. but they'd rather say 1300s so that then they can turn around and say, well, we can't find anything in 1300s, so it never happened at all. Exactly. Not right. true. Okay. Yeah, so the, the takeaways on this slide is the Greek translators... Um, Greek. Notice Greek. The Greek translators read that word in Hebrew, pillished him, right? They mm-hmm. didn't... And they read it as basically... How do I say this? They they rendered it as a proper noun, right? Rather than saying like immigrants or invaders, they right. took they took that Hebrew That's, word and basically made it into a nationality. Right. That's how you get the Philistines. And then you fast forward to the Roman period, and Romans very much adopted Greek culture and so on, and basically revitalized that name in how they identified Judea after the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, after the Jews rebelled and were crushed, like, like, you know, and, but there's one thing also we have to say, Steve, which people don't realize. Mm-hmm. We have been told what it says here. The name was revived by the Romans in the second century CE in the te- in the, in the name Syria, Palestina. Mm-hmm. Okay. But if I remember correctly, the first time we see the word Palestine written to refer to that group is another 200 years later it's like the 400s like the fifth century i think i think that's right before we see that word in print sure well the the whole point of it was to really 
To, it was to negate Jewish identity. Exactly. And to say, see, the Jews aren't really here. It's only the Palestinians, even though the name Palestinian, you know, Palestine, Philistine comes from the word meaning. They ain't from here. Yeah. And the Romans were notorious for that. Read any, I mean, read Julius Caesar's writings on his um, conquest of Gaul, right? They they make their, they propagandize their enemies and even use psychological tactics to win the war before it's won, right? Yeah. So using tactics like this is, you know, you see it throughout Roman literature and, and propaganda. But right. the, the main takeaway of the of the slide here is that that province was Judea before the revolt, you know, and then, yes. and then in an attempt to really de-Judaize right, right. the region, they renamed yes. it to right. Syria, Palestina. Yep. Now we're going to get into some Tanakh. Want me to read it or do you want to read it? I'll read it. I don't care. Okay. This is from Jeremiah chapter 47, verse four, Jeremiah 47, four. Because of the day that comes to destroy all the Philistines and to cut off from Tyre and Sidon every helper who remains. For the eternal will destroy the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaftor. Okay, and Kaftor. Not, not, the, not the remnant of the country of, of Palestine, not the country of Judea, not the country of Canaan. Yep. But Kaftor. I'm and where, 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 where's Kaftor? Well, we're going to discuss it, but as a you know prelude, Kaftor is actually the the island of Crete. In other words, not indigenous. Right. Amos chapter nine verse seven: Are you not like the Cushites to me, O people of Israel? Saith the Eternal, Did I not bring Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Arameans from Kir? Once again, they are not. <laughs> they're not from philistia right they're from kaftor right. and right. were labeled philistines because they immigrated invaded intruded upon the land of israel there on the southern coast from kaftor mm -hmm. meaning, meaning where was the uh, where was it again crete exactly so and crete belonged to what country at the time this would have taken place well it would have been the minoans but the uh greece Big, yeah, the Minoan subset of mm -hmm. the Greek people. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, they're Greek. They're not Jewish. They're not indigenous. Right. Okay. And archaeology actually proves this, and we're going to get into that next. Good. So this comes from an article on National Geographic. Okay. I'll link, I'll link the exact article in the description. Please. Uh, the authors of the Hebrew Bible made it clear that the Philistines were not like them. Okay, that's a major takeaway. The, uh, they're not like them. This uncircumcised group is described in several passages as coming from the land of Kaftor, which we just we just read, which is modern-day Crete, before taking control of the coastal region of what is now southern Israel and the Gaza Strip. Modern archaeologists agree that the Philistines were different from their neighbors, their arrival on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean in the early 12th century BCE is marked by pottery with those close parallels to the ancient Greek world. The use of an Aegean instead of Semitic script and the consumption of pork. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what the Aegean is, the Aegean is the sea that basically separates Greece and Turkey. That little that little sea there between like it's the a little Western area. Like a, like a subset of the Mediterranean. Basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the four early Iron Age DNA samples, all from infants buried beneath the floors of Philistine houses, include proportionally more additional European ancestry in their genetic signatures, roughly 14%, than in the pre-Philistine Bronze Age samples, which was only 2 to 9%. According to the researchers, while the origins of this additional European ancestry are not conclusive, the most plausible models point to Greece, Crete, Sardinia, and the Iberian Peninsula, which okay. is as far west as Rome and Spain. Now, for those of us who are not scientists and DNA experts, can you translate that to English? To translate that to English, basically, <laughs> the when it says the pre-Philistine Bronze Age samples, that means people before the time period of 
the early 12th century as to when they would have come would have only had two to nine percent european in their dna okay now after that point and mind you, this this was taken from a cemetery in Ashkelon. So this is a clearly Philistine city. Um, after that point, after 12th century BCE, now you're getting up to four, like a 14 percent, which is, you know, a 10 to, which is a 12 to 5 percent increase across the board. Um, they could deduce that they did in fact eat pork. Uh, yeah, not 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 Jews, right? The not script, in, no longer indigenous, no longer. Yeah, the script know. is Trans-Aegean, which means it's Greek in origin, right? So this is very interesting archaeology that not only confirms the Bible, but kind of disconfirms any idea that modern day Palestine or was, Palestinians are from Palest the area wasn't. Right, right, exactly. And I think I want to say that probably a very vast majority of modern day Palestinians are of Arabic descent, right? Right. That's not the same thing. No, it definitely is not. So just something for everyone to think about. You know, the original Philistines, Palestinians, whatever you want to call them, were seafaring colonizing white men <laughs> and yes you have to remind people that if it means greet okay crete they're not they're not middle east they're they're not, they're yeah, they're not, and they're white. They're not jews yeah right right. Mm -hmm. right they're europeans and again to emphasize the fact it means the modern day arab peoples are not philistine are not palestinian right right Especially when we showed in our last video, um, the sorry, I just had a major brain fart. Yeah, it the, happens to me the, all the time. The Jordanian, the Jordanian um, initi initiating of the 1948 war, right? When they right. when they invaded into the West Bank. Yep. So. You know, it's it's just quite interesting, and it, it indicates how badly things can be facts can be manipulated. Sure. So the sure. people don't even know the facts mm -hmm. and think they know from from who knows what. Right, and you know, it's it's almost like comic relief when that word, that name, Palestine, is still utilized. When mm -hmm. what they're saying is, <laughs> well, saying Steve, is we're we're intruders, can, but we want to be free from the oppression of the indigenous. You know, that's Steve. They can call themselves whatever they want, and if they want to call themselves Palestinian, that's fine. But we still have to recognize that the word basically means you ain't one of us. You're not indigenous. You're not right. part of us. You invaded. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if they want to use that term, they can call themselves anything they want. Sure. Okay. Yes. And this comes from Britannica. All right. And the map on the right is a rough um, map of the where invasions. Sure. Yeah. The the immigration routes, I guess you could say, or the yeah. routes taken by these peoples. Um, and over here, as you can see, Kaftor is Greet or Crete. Uh, Mycenae, this is Greece, and right here, can you see my cursor on the screen, by the way? Yes, yes. Okay. So this area here is the Aegean, like from Greece to Troy, right? Mm -hmm. That's the Aegean, okay? So the Britannica says that the first records of the Philistines are inscriptions and reliefs in the mortuary temple of Ramses III at Medinat Habu, where they appear under the name... PRST, I, I assume that's probably a continental language also, hmm. uh, as one of the Sea Peoples that invaded Egypt about 1190 BCE after ravaging Anatolia, Cyprus, and Syria. So here's, this is what these arrows are right. indicating. If they were ravaging Anatolia first, Anatolia is Turkey, right? 
Yes. So they made their way through across the Aegean. So it's even showing that they're from the mainland Greece also. Right. Um, Cause I'm sure there would have been some type of conglomeration yes. of sea peoples or something. Steve, I, I'm having a little brain, brain problem of my own. Here we see what's clearly Greece. Mm -hmm. Where on the map would Italy be? Isn't Italy, isn't Italy East closer to Israel than Greece no, no. is? Italy is more West. Is, is West. Okay. Just Italy. making sure because the map, the map seems twist turns to me somehow. Yes. Yeah, so, so if, if you, if you can see my cursor, Italy. Yes. Was, okay. Right, right All right. All right. Because it just looks slops something twisted. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. So like this down here, that's the Northern coast of Africa. Right. Yeah. I see Egypt there, but right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what you're seeing is that Egypt, even Egyptian sources are saying at that same time, um, you're European, getting invaded. European sea peoples, which they, you know, called the same thing were attacking or invading or what have you. Right. And it even shows that the Egyptian forces were moving up into Israel at the same time, which is right. And, and this would have been around the time of the uh, Exodus 1190 BCE is 200 years earlier, 1190 from 1450, well, let's say. So 1190 BCE is 200 years after when the, yeah, no, no, the, yes, the, the Exodus is 200 years earlier as well. Was... Right. Yep. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah it's even showing them it's even showing their their direction of travel coming from mainland greece which is quite interesting yes it is um still looks distorted to me but i can't figure out why all right it's probably that, to be able to show the red arrows well i actually think the image was taken out of a book so that might be why uh, okay upset. all right um, yes but really it's just to show the place of origin Right. Right. Yes. Which is the Greek European continent. Right. And the direction which they went and clearly that they were utilizing sea travel. So these sea peoples, you know, it, it all fits. It all fits with Tanakh. Yes. Right. Um, so right. that's the last slide. But from that, right, I'm one, one more thing, one more thing I want to, I do want to talk about, Steve. Mm -hmm. and it's a it's a book that's controversial only because it says things that people don't want to know sure okay the book is the book <laughs> is called from time immemorial from time immemorial okay this woman was paid basically to go to israel and start fully researching the origins of the peoples there with the whole intent of showing that the jews were not indigenous that they invaded that they're all european etc cetera, etc cetera. And she did the work and found out that, no, actually, the Jews are the indigenous people here. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why, and, and Palestinian only is used in terms of the Arab community. It's not used in terms of people from Crete. Right. And so she's found out, and she's published this in the book from time immemorial. She published this in the book that said, basically, as the Jews made the desert bloom, it created jobs that would have the Arab Muslim people come into Israel from the surrounding Muslim Arab countries mm -hmm. to get jobs, to get employment. And, wow. and that, that book, you'll, you'll hear people, if you mention the book, people say, oh, that book was, was uh, uh, what's, what's their word? Debunked. Uh, de debunked. That's exactly <laughs> their word. That book was debunked. You say, oh, really? Who debunked it? Blank stares. Yeah, because they don't know. What, what, it hasn't been. When was it debunked? What, what books debunk it? Blank stares. All they know is the line. Oh, that book was debunked. Well, no, it wasn't. That's the problem. And and the author uh, of the book was supposed to come in and prove the opposite of what she actually had proof of. Well, another another way to really confirm that is, I mean, are they debunking Mark Twain's book too? When he said he came to Israel and it looked like a barren wasteland? Right. And who was living there at the time? The right? Jews. Mark Twain. Every oh. single, every single uh, census ever taken, the Jews always outnumbered the uh, 
Muslim Arab population. Sure. Okay. Well, he said and, at the and, time it was a barren wasteland, and that was before right. most of the Jews were in the land, right? Before it was really repopulated as Israel again. Right. But there were always Jews living oh, there. Oh, of course. Of course. Right. Of course. Right. What I'm it, saying is, really at the pinnacle of the exile, right, Israel was a wasteland. Right. You know, nothing was growing. Um, and then, you know, you fast forward to you know, 1948 and onward, and look, Israel you know, is even, exporting produce. You know, it's even it's, before that. Mm -hmm. Even before that, you, in the remember, Mark Twain, who said who described it as a barren wasteland, was late 1800s. Yep. Okay. So, a, as late as the late 1800s, but you also had the first Yeshua, the first return of Jews back to their promised homeland uh, in the 1800s, and so that's when the return of the Jews came. And even though there were already Jews living there, mm -hmm. uh, and they started turning the desert into a blooming green area, yep, which, which created jobs, which meant that the uh, Arab Muslims are going to move in to get jobs. Mm -hmm. But I, I'd recommend the book from Time Immemorial. And I can't remember the name of the woman who authored the book, but mm. you know, it's a and, and read up on it, you'll see that it's a pretty fascinating study. <laughs> definitely definitely yeah well all right rabbi anything yep. any final statements oh no just uh just remember the history right don't ignore the history for the sake of what is politically correct and politically expedient right yeah because if you don't know your history you're doomed to repeat it right so and create an awful lot of unfairness for 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 the for the truth and the people who know that truth right most certainly so, yep well all right everybody uh, i hope this helped and i hope this was some relevant historical context that a lot of people you know really like a final statement i i scroll through social media and stuff and see a lot of people post a lot of stuff and as you know, I'm a big student of history. It's it's one of my favorite things to study. I, I love it. Love it. Um, and I understand you can't know what you don't know, but the information is out there, right? Right. And I see a lot of uninformed people making what seem to be informed statements, <clears throat> you know, and it's just so totally wrong, not knowing the first thing of what they're saying. And it's kind of hard not to get burned up. And that's what motivates me to make content like this. Because the <laughs> the voices that are so resonant on the internet, right? The the people you're hearing are the ones who know the least about the situation. Usually true. And um, yeah, maybe it's time for the people who do actually know something to start speaking out too. So that's why I'm wanting to make content like this, like the one we made before about about um. British mandate Palestine and, and so on and so forth. Because uh, I was speaking with a friend recently and he said the same thing. He's like, most people nowadays, uh, they think history started in 1900. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, you know, that's, that's so true. You know, like they, yeah. and. Uh, By the way, the author of the book from time immemorial is a woman named Joan Peters. Okay. Joan I'll link Peters. The book in the description. Well, put the book in the description but according to Amazon, isn't it interesting that it's just hard to come by? Mm. Well, I'll see if I can find on a different site and put that link there. Yeah. But, all right, my friend. That was a good one. Um, I thought so. Like I said, I hope it's some relevant information for everyone. I hope, I hope it gets out there and I hope people actually watch it and take it in, you know. Don't just yes. write it off because what it's about, <laughs> you know, so. But everybody, Rabbi Stuart Federo, author of Judaism and Christianity, a contrast. Available in the description. Please check that book out. He will appreciate it. Learn Hebrew in one hour. Also linked. Uh, how's that video doing? You into the 600,000s yet? Not quite, but I think we broke 550,000. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, follow that link, watch that video, watch it as many times as you need until you perfect it. 
Uh, and you also have some work sheets coming one regular, in. One line. Well, the what Jews, I'm sorry, the, the uh, website hebrewjumpstart.com, I'm hoping the next few weeks we'll have uploaded to it for download, uh, is well, a workbook to help a person practice reading out loud uh, hmm. the Hebrew that they've learned from the video. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So check that out, everyone. Excellent resource and can kind of clear up some of the stuff we even talked about in this video with how knowing Hebrew is vastly superior to reading through a translation. Um, yeah. By the way, the Hebrew learn, Hebrew jumpstart, learn how to read Hebrew in one hour is 552,000 views in less than a year. Awesome. Incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. Yep. But okay, everybody, this was the Exodus Project. I'm Steve Eisenhower, Rabbi Stuart Federal, and we'll see you in the next video, everybody. Thank you.